Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to co-chair this session with uh, Didier Cheche. Uh, we're going to start by uh, mentioning some objectives of the session. So we are here together to learn a bit more about Medtronix, Mitral, and Tricuspid clinical trial updates. There's a lot of expectations from this program. To better understand the treatable anatomies for TMVR, remember some of you have seen this recent poll about uh, how to select patients for uh, percutaneous repair or replacement for mitral disease, and also to help you gaining awareness on early feasibility intrepid data that we are looking forward to see much more present in our hands and for our patients. So uh, we will have three presentations, one that I'll be giving myself, one that Didier will be sharing also with us, and one recorded session from our f f uh, colleague, Firaz Zar from United States. Uh, Didier will be taking also the questions from the chat, but really we encourage you to, to participate and interact with us uh, to make this session lively. So I will start by the first presentation, which is an intrepid overview and trial updates. So, Okay, I mean, we all know that mitral regurgitation is highly prevalent, uh, but the disease is very heterogeneous. The prevalence of the mitral regurgitation actually is much more uh, important than the aortic stenosis. Of course, in that we mean that there's mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation, but it means that this disease has to be tackled much more and much better than we can do it today in patients who, in a population which is not necessarily operable. And on the right part of the screen, there are some examples of the heterogeneity of uh, the, the anatomical presentations of the valve that we are treating on our daily basis as surgeons. This is what we see uh, also in daily life. So it gives you an idea about the complexity uh, of adapting or tailoring a therapy percutaneously to this kind of uh, multivariant diseases. So, uh, Today, what we know about treating mitral regurgitation is the following. Uh, in this heterogeneous clinical and anatomical uh, population, we have focused a lot on the, uh, on the anatomy, but we must not forget that the clinical presentation also depends uh, on the disease underlying the, 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 the mitral regurgitation itself. Uh, optimal therapy selection remains complex, but is really mandatory to guarantee not only the early term success, but the midterm and long term. The gold standard today uh, for non-operable patients of, is, of course, a uh, tier that has demonstrated consistent beneficial outcomes uh, for primary, but also in some uh, selected, based on co-opt study, of course, secondary mitral regurgitation. However, severe, uh, several mitral regurgitation patient categories remain not studied and will not be optimally treated by a tier uh, uh, option. Uh, we know also that numerous studies from the surgical literature, but also the transcatheter therapies, demonstrated that reduction and, elimin uh, and elimination of mitral regurgitation is essential for optimal patient outcomes. So uh, this slide summarizes uh, some of the data that uh, about the efficacy of when you use a tier therapy in eliminating mitral regurgitation, and you see that. Uh, although there are a lot of improvements based on our, the progress of our practice, but also the iterations uh, of the therapies that we have in our hands, we still have a consistent, consistent number of patients that leave the, uh, the hybrid room or the cat lab with the mitral regurgitation uh, with grade two and plus. And this is definitely not, does not give us any satisfaction, not for us, but not for the patient, primarily. And for, when we look at the category of patients in whom we are not able to achieve this successful result, we know that we have to look at the other options and keep our mind open. So this also graph shows clearly what I have I've been uh, uh, trying to allude to before. Uh, if you have a patient who leaves the hospital with a grade three to four mitral regurgitation after his uh, tear treatment, the risk of mortality is much higher 
than if he leaves it with the grade one or grade two. You see it, and the, significant, the difference is very significant. This is true for primary. This is even true for secondary mitral regurgitation. And that shows also that we have to be really optimal and select much better our patients. And that's why this reason, this is the reason why transcatheter mitral valve replacement, such as with intrabit system, may be a treatment option for patients unsuitable for tear. The intrabit system with the transfemoral approach, which is a fantastic evolution over time, has shown encouraging outcomes that has been presented recently at the TCT and that we share with you here today in its early feasibility study. And lately, and this is a very good announcement, the FDA has approved the inclusion of transfemoral system as an additional delivery route for the Apollo pivotal trial that's already enrolling in USA. So the promise of TMVR is first, to offer for our patients a less invasive than open surgery, of course. And we hope that this will allow to have less complications related to the access uh, itself. It, it is supposed to give, and in real life, it shows that it's predictable and durable over time to eliminate mitral regurgitation. I will show you some data with this regard. And it could treat much larger uh, and wider anatomies and pathologies than only repair systems, which addresses univocal or focal uh, 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 therapy, depending on the disease. It showed to be easier to use, easier to adopt, and to th it is more generalizable, uh, of course. So for those who do, do, do not really know what the interpret valve looks like, it's a self-expandable device. It has two uh, components, the out and disc that helps anchoring in the matter annulus, and on the leaflets themselves. And the, that outer disc houses the internal disc, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, the, the real valve, I would say, uh, which houses a porcine pericardium uh, uh, valve. Today, we have two sizes, 42 and 48. And uh, they are the bigger, bigger size, which is coming soon. The journey started in 2014, you see? So this is really very new with the pilot study to which we have participated with Didier here. And it was with the first generation of trisapical uh, device. Uh, and then the Apollo one have been submitted and started enrolling in USA. And it was uh, the study who wanted to, to address the results for uh, mitral regurgitation treatment uh, uh, in a randomized controlled trial versus surgery in high risk, operable, and extreme risk patients. And then we kept on evolving over time. The protocol has been amended. Apollo 1 uh, with a single arm uh, with a recoverable 3A device. So there was an iteration. The first generation of TA was not recoverable. The second one was recoverable. And we included also treatment of patients which were unsuitable for surgery or third treatment. And luckily, at the end of 2020 also, the transfemoral system appeared with the first generation and then We've been treating the same population of patients. And lately, uh, as I've said before, uh, FDA approved the second generation of transfemoral device, which is going to be used also in this category of patients. So, so far, uh, since 2014, 300, more than 300 patients have been treated via both transapical and transfemoral. Uh, and we have, so far, more than five years follow-up, which is really very important data uh, to, to show. So I will show you some slides from the pilot study and Apollo 1 uh, study. Uh, so the, in this global study, we have in, in the pilot study, global one, 95 patients have been included. In the Apollo uh, randomized trial, we included 57 in the cohort uh, randomized trial and in the single roll-in cohort, 56. If you look at the, the, the baseline characteristics of these patients, you see that they are all at high risk. Uh, the, the STS score mean was 6.4, the Euro score 2, 6.9. Many patients, more than 40% had the prior cabbage, so the access using transapical was very challenging. Many of them had COPD. Uh, many of them had also peripheral vascular disease. Uh, but they were all very symptomatic. NYH A class of uh, 3, 4, more than 80% of the patients. We included primary and secondary uh, mitral regurgitation patients, and some of them were, had mixed disease. The majority of patients, more than 95, had more uh, than moderate to severe mitral regurgitation and with impaired 
an impaired left ventricle ejection fraction and dilated ventricle. So these baseline characteristics highlight and show how difficult was this population that we have been treated. Uh, we were happy to see that the therapy was effective, although it was enrolling a lot of transapical patients in the beginning, and the all-cause mortality in this high-risk population was 12% uh, at one month, 16% sorry, at one year. The heart failure uh, readmission was 10% at one month, 23% at one year. And uh, the, we, we have been facing all stroke rate, which is really very acceptable in the population. Remember, almost 20% of the population had peripheral arterial disease, which increases the risk, of course. Uh, we had some bleeding events, which is definitely uh, and more related to the access itself. No endocarditis had been shown. And only one patient have a major device thrombus. Uh, if you look at the all-cause mortality, uh, beyond one year, you can see it here, it's still more or less stable. And, and uh, the readmission for heart failure uh, is also very acceptable in this population of patients. Remember also that many of them has or had functional mitral regurgitation. Uh, the durability of the performance of the valve itself has been shown in this uh, paired echo uh, data, as you can see it. So the patient had almost all moderate to severe mitral regurgitation, and you can see it at one month, six months, one year, and even two years, which is really consistent. We have more than 62 patients that have been followed up to two years. And you see there is definitely an elimination of mitral regurgitation. And with any appears again, you can see it is still very moderate here. And this is also very satisfactory. Mean gradient remains stable over time. Uh, no increase in gradient. And uh, either in the, I mean, both at the level of the valve itself, but also in the LVOT, uh, uh, both for peak and mean gradients. More importantly, I mean, these patients are referred because they, are, they have functional complaints. And then we wanted to be sure that this therapy will give them much more better quality of life. So the, the NYHI NYHA classification shows clearly that this therapy is effective. So we are treating symptoms probably for functional mitral regurgitation, but we are treating also the disease for, for the other ones. And this is effective. It's shown clearly here. And this remains stable over time. Uh, the quality of life in both using two scores, one which is the MN living for the heart failure, but also the KCCQ uh, quality of life score shows a consistent improvement. And we are very happy to, to, to see that for, for all our patients. So these were, were the results with the first part of the study. And then two years ago, we started enrolling for Apollo 1 with this new recoverable device. And of course, the, the, the study was supposed to, to, to randomize patients who are suitable for surgery, but also uh, the others. But we wanted also to, to address, in another pivotal trial, the, those who had prohibitive complex tear anatomy. It's not only clinical uh, problem, but also anatomical problem, as you can see it here. And this is one of the questions that we all have every day when we look at the selection criteria of our patients. Of course, some of them is because the complexity of the anatomy before, in a pure MR, but some of the others because they have MAC. MAC is very challenging, I mean, in, in, for any repair devices. And we have to address this. This is an unmet need. We have been looking uh, uh, for the inclusion criteria. Uh, very uh, in, in a, uh, we, we spend a lot of time looking at the, the inclusion criteria. And of course, we have been discussing with uh, eminent experts for TEAR. And you can see it here. I mean, the patients that we have been considering not eligible or not suitable or not optimally suitable for TEAR are patients that in our daily life, even if we have a lot of expertise, we know that with, for them, the, the predictability of success when we do uh, tear uh, is not what we uh, want it to be. Uh, so for this uh, Apollo pivotal trial in the MAC cohort also, you, you can see it here very clearly, we uh, wanted to include up to 300 maximum patients. So having a double disc, the external one, internal one, uh, with, a con with a good radio force, allow uh, intrepid to be used in MAC patients, as you can see. So it can be a bit squeezed outside the, the, for the outer frame, but the internal valve functionality is preserved because of this. Uh, one of the 
other challenges we have with TMVR, which is related to the profile of the valve itself, is the risk of LVOT obstruction. And we have worked a lot on improving the screening process. And we have, as you can see it here, a methodology that help us deciding which patient is green, which one is uh, yellow, which one is red, uh, with high, very high risk of LVOT, a risk obstruction. And we don't only focus on one part of the cycle or a mean and calculation of the LVOT or uh, NEO LVOT area. We, we calculate it at different phases of the cycle. Uh, and we try uh, very scientifically, I would say, to, to de decide who's eligible and who's not eligible and, and who's red, who's light. Uh, so we have made a lot of efforts to enlarge the inclusion criteria for, for our patients. And uh, lately, as I said, uh, the, the group has been working uh, uh, really hard to make improvements and bring to our hands the transfemoral system. Uh, and this is what has happened. Uh, and we are now able to include with the second generation transfemoral device uh, the, in, for the Apollo 2 trial. So this is how it looks like. So today it's still uh, for, this is the system that has been used in the early feasibility study that is enrolling in US, as you can see it, 15 sites, 45 patients, almost done. Uh, uh, so this is a trascatheter system that reminds you more or less what something that you are familiar with, with other therapies that helps you going in all directions, going across the septum and then going medial, lateral, anterior, posterior, expand or extend the valve in order to position it. And those who have been doing transapically uh, the intrepid they see the same images almost with this transfemoral system, which is very uh, uh, happy to see uh, for us who we will be enrolling soon, I hope, in Europe. There will be another generation, which is a 29 French, which will reduce the probable risk of uh, vascular complications. And we think that with this 25, nine French, 29, five, 29 French <laughs> profile, we probably will not need any surgical cut down anymore. And this also will help improving or reducing the invasivity of the disease. And we are also happy to announce that we will have a 54 valve size. We know many patients are referred to us today with very large uh, uh, annulus and uh, which we cannot treat. With this big valve, we will be able to enlarge the access to this therapy. Of course, it will be offered uh, as in the beginning for a prohibitive risk patients in a single arm one, but also we will keep on enrolling with the, uh, for the other part of the study, for the RCT, uh, where we'll be comparing uh, intrepid to uh, suitable patients for surgery, but also uh, the others. So in conclusion, uh, I would like to say that optimal patient and therapy selection is really important and crucial. And uh, we are all happy to have more than one option available for our patients, repair or replacement. No du duality, there's, there's no fight. I think we have to put the patient the, in the middle of everything and choose what is best for him and not the opposite. Uh, approved interventions to treat mitral regurgitation, surgery and tear are well established uh, in appropriately selected patient population. Patients who are unsuitable for approved therapies may be suitable for single arm trials, and Intrepid is offering one of these. The Apollo study is currently enrolling in, in USA. Uh, are, uh, patients who are ineligible for surgery and unsuitable for tear. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, so f thank you, uh, Thomas, for this um, excellent uh, overview of uh, the clinical program. So we can see that this is, this is quite a robust uh, clinical program uh, focusing on the interpret uh, device. Uh, so clearly there is a kind of uh, unmet need, and we all agree on that, that on the mitral field there is, um, there is a need for uh, transcaptor mitral valve replacement devices because there are so certain anatomies that we cannot treat. And it was interesting um, uh, when we uh, discussed during uh, the early, uh, the first day of uh, London valves, uh, there was a poll about what could be the future of uh, transcaptor mitral valve inter interventions. And almost 70% of the, pa the, the, the people responded uh, TMVR. So definitely a replacement. There is a strong feeling that replacement is going to be uh, the default strategy in the future. 
And do you believe that uh, one of the reasons could be that it keeps the door open for a further intervention in the future if we uh, aim at treating younger patients with uh, longer life expectancy? Do you believe that we should start with a repair as the default strategy or a replacement? Which strategy keeps the door more open for any further intervention? Um, I'm just thinking Tough how question. to put my, <laughs> my ideas in a row and uh, make a, a nice progression. So we know that if you replace, you generate potentially uh, a problem that is resolving today an issue, but you have to figure out how to treat it if you have a degeneration of the valve. We know that durability is an issue for, for valves. But it has to be the same approach also for repair systems. So if you want to repair a patient because it's less invasive, you have to be sure of two things, that you are eliminating the disease. This is what the patient is ca came to see you. But also if, and we know that happens for many reasons, if there is a recurrency of the mitral regurgitation, you have to be able to treat it. So I think in many patients we will not, uh, we will have to select in a personalized approach. Some of them will be better starting with repair, some of them will be better starting with replacement. But whatever the choice is, we have to, deep, to keep this door open, as you have said. So there, were, there is one uh, question coming from Paul Brennan, who is uh, here uh, today. Um, it's re it relates to the uh, antithrombotic or anticoagulant treatment for these TMVR patients. Um, even though it's a bovine pericardial tissue that is uh, integrated uh, within the uh, intrepid device, if the patient is not um, doesn't exert atrial fibrillation, what would you recommend? A patient in sinus rhythm after uh, transcaptor mitral valve replacement with the intrepid, what would be your uh, strategy in terms of anticoagulation? So we have no data supporting any, any particular strategy. What, what we recommend in our experience is at least six months of oral anticoagulation. Uh, I think we, can, we have to be able to extend this uh, length of uh, treatment if you have a large atrium, for example. Uh, uh, and of course, if patients have uh, a fibr uh, atrial fibrillation. But this is also one of the, the questions that we have addressed over time, and we, uh, we need some follow-up and, and more experience with this. Okay, so uh, you nicely demonstrated that uh, with the uh, intrepid device uh, in high-risk patients, the results are really uh, uh, impressive, and uh, we have sustained uh, results up to five years, and this is quite uh, encouraging for, for the future. For sure, there will be uh, uh, improvement in the design and uh, in the selection process of the patient. We're going to discuss furthermore the issue of LVOT obstruction, but I would like to uh, drive you for the next uh, five minutes towards uh, what could be uh, the outcomes, the procedural outcomes with this platform uh, in more complex patients, more complex anatomies. So let's see uh, what uh, the intrepid can achieve in these kind of red zone uh, patients. Uh, so uh, as a background, for sure, uh, the, uh, with the um, experience uh, uh, acquired from the co-op trial and all the uh, procedural experience with the tier uh, procedures. Uh, tier has become the default strategy, so it has become quite difficult to enroll patients within uh, trials uh, because the first strategy, given the, uh, the good results with h 2 h repair, is to consider that therapy. However, we all agree, because we are all physicians or we are, or we are in contact with patients, we see clearly that there are some anatomies that are not suitable uh, for a h 2 h repair. Uh, I will try to drive you through these uh, anatomies and try to understand what could be uh, the uh, procedural um, efficiency of the intrepid device in such complex anatomies. So, there, there has been this uh, Art Valve Collaboratory Initiative that has uh, uh, published this paper identifying who could be the non-suitable, unsuitable patients and anatomies for an edge to edge repair. So let me uh, drive you uh, uh, during the next minutes through uh, this type of anatomies. So overall, if we um, uh, skip the really favorable anatomies, the moderately complex anatomies uh, that could still be treated with an edge-to-edge -edge, uh, technique. Uh, we can uh, 
um, we roughly estimate that 15 to 25% of the mitral regurgitation patients are not suitable candidates uh, for an H2H -H repair. So this is quite a significant proportion of our daily practice patients. So uh, there is a need for this kind of single harm registries with TMVR, trying to understand what are the outcomes uh, in such anatomies. Uh, so Thomas has um, uh, presented that, so roughly we can uh, split these patients into three groups. The first groups are the anatomies that are associated with stenosis, whether it be excessive uh, MAC uh, configuration, severe leaflet calcification, leaflet uh, um, uh, really uh, calcified, and uh, uh, also patients with multiple regurgitant jets, you need to, uh, to put several edge-to-edge uh, -edge, uh, repair devices. This could impact uh, the uh, final gradient at the end of the procedure. The second group is that the, the patients for whom we anticipate to have a suboptimal results, and you nicely uh, demonstrated that through your lecture, Thomas. If we leave the room, the OR with moderate regurgitation for our patient, this is going to impact the survival so survival is the hardest endpoint that we want to uh, we promote for our patients. Uh, we want to avoid mortality, so definitely uh, achieving a good result is, uh, is definitely key. So sometimes, uh, for instance, when we have clefts, uh, when we have uh, uh, extreme uh, diffuse bowel disease, it may be difficult to get a, a proper uh, result. And at last, the third group is these patients, the group of patients with over uh, reasons, uh, for instance, inability to get uh, to acquire proper uh, intraprocedural imaging uh, to guide the procedure. So roughly, these are the three groups that have been identified. Uh, so uh, a couple of patients, just to illustrate that. So this is the first patient. All the patients that uh, I'm going to present are from the Apollo trial, and there are uh, transapical patients. So uh, there is, uh, it's really encouraging for the future, because if we think about the transseptal uh, uh, device, we could even uh, expect uh, further, uh, better results for our patients. So here is a patient uh, uh, for whom you can see that the the main reason for uh, the, uh, uh, denying an h 2 h repair was a severe MAC uh, configuration, and you can see that the gradient at baseline was high. Uh, almost a circumferential calcification of the posterior mitral annulus, but also the, on the anterior side. And you can see on the CT uh, acquisition, clearly the bulk of calcium at the level of the uh, uh, mitral annulus. And here is the outcome for this patient, and this is really, this was really impressive. And uh, you could see that the final gradient, transvalvular gradient, was only two. No regurgitation, but this is a constant finding of after these uh, TMVR procedures, particularly with the interpret platform. Uh, you can appreciate the circularity of the overall uh, inner stand frame, and this could be a surrogate for sustained durability in the future. No regurgitation, no uh, minimal gradient, and a minimal LVOT gradient. Uh, another uh, patient here for whom uh, the, uh, the main uh, indication for denying edge to edge repair was the multiple clefts, as you can appreciate on the 3D uh, rendering uh, echo imaging. Uh, clearly, this is not a favorable, and I think we all agree on that, favorable anatomy for an edge to edge repair with a massive regurgitation, so this patient deserved the treatment. And once again, this is a type of result that was obtained in such a complex anatomy with a, a final gradient of four, LVOT gradient of 14, no regurgitation, and a device that once again is perfectly circular uh, um, at the location of the inner stent housing the leaflets. So another uh, patient, even more complex anatomy uh, with a quite uh, obvious risk of mitral stenosis. We can see that the posterior leaflet is really uh, minimal. We have that kind of calcification of the posterior aspect of the uh, mitral annulus. Uh, the anterior mitral leaflet is really redundant, diff diffusely diseased. And this is quite constant in terms of procedural result. Uh, low gradient, n barely a very minimal, tiny regurgitation, central regurgitation that is going to likely uh, disappear uh, during the follow-up, and a device that is circular. A couple of additional patients, uh, even um, even more complex uh, patient, and you can see that the uh, when you uh, watch the uh, have a look at the aspect of the interior uh, mitral leaflet, clearly uh, this is a challenging anatomy. And once again. 
no minimal gradient, no regurgitation, and a circular device. So this is really impressive, and this is constant, even in that uh, for this last, last case, uh, for whom you can see that uh, the uh, overall anatomy of the, the mitral valve once again, is once again complex. And if I had to treat this patient with an H2H -H repair, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do it because I, there, are, there is an inherent risk of mitral stenosis or leaving a significant regurgitation at the end. And that's uh, once again, reproducibility of the, dis the, the results uh, uh, with the Interpid uh, platform. So just to, uh, to conclude, so uh, just to tell you that about 15 to 25 percent of our daily practice patients uh, are not suitable candidates for H2H -H repair. For, so for these patients, there is a potential benefit of the TMVR uh, with the Intrepid, uh, so we need to explore that furthermore. And these so-called red zone uh, patients, uh, we have described the anatomy that are not suitable, so you've seen that. And we are looking forward for the single arms trials, uh, such, as, such as the Apollo, uh, that are studying the uh, impact of TMVR in these complex uh, patients. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, DJ. Is there any question from the audience, please? It gives you some time to see the chat. So th there, uh, there is one question. Um, it's uh, about the procedural risk. And the question is as is. It's coming from uh, Martin uh, Van Haarberke. So what is the, uh, is there a risk of um, impeaching the uh, circumflex artery with these uh, devices? So it's, uh, I, I think that from the, um, the clinical data that we have, this is not a, a major risk and this has not been reported. And so uh, we've seen that with uh, over uh, repair technologies, uh, for instance, the coronary sinus uh, repair technologies, sometimes you, we ended up with some uh, impairment of the, uh, the flow in the left circumflex. This is not something that, it, that seems to uh, uh, be uh, a complication of the uh, TMVR, particularly with the Intrepid uh, platform. You can see that the brim nicely conforms to the, uh, to the shape of the left atrium. The inner stent remains circular, and so the overall risk of interacting with the coronary arteries is uh, virtually uh, negligible for uh, this uh, platform. Stefan, you're an expert. I see you from here. <laughs> In, in both therapies. And I would like to have your thoughts. I mean, based on what we have presented, but also on this last poll that Didier alluded to. How do you see the, the immediate future of this therapy in this uh, landscape of uh, transcatheter come, repair? Come, come to come us. Come with us, come. Join us, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Mr. Van <Bamber> Delevin. <laughs> I think the major steps are minimal access points to this therapy, and we've nicely seen that actually some repair complications are not encountered in replacement. I think this is a huge message. I think you, Thomas, made the right message too, and this is that the vascular access will be key. All we learned from Taver is that vascular access is a key component to safety and to success, and I think if we go beyond and below 30 French access systems will be very successful with these technologies. And I also think that neither the circumflex artery nor the outflow tract in the long term will be a major problem in 90% of the cases. Of course, there will be a residuum of those uh, MAC cases that are to have two small ventricles, as we know them from mitral stenosis. So these patients will be difficult to treat, but for the others, this is a great technology. And do you think also that uh, the anatomical variabilities will be addressed also with this therapy? Yeah, I think we're, we're in the early learning curve, and you showed that we are in the first and second generation. This is not the end of the journey. So as we learn more, we'll see that there will be perhaps some elliptical shapes to the devices in the outer brim that will adopt more and more to natural anatomy. We learn more and more about the durability and what we can do for durability. So far, these devices are 27 millimeter devices, but they, it may be that it is not one size fits all in the future. So I think there's a lot to come and wait for the third and fourth generation devices, and they will adapt even more as we learn with the anticoagulation, as we learn with other therapies in the follow-up. Right. Thank you, Stefan. 
So there, um, there is one uh, question uh, coming from uh, uh, Monica Flores Mausa that is connected, remotely connected, about the um, ability to treat mitral stenosis with the uh, Intrepid platform, and that's exactly one of the uh, uh, the complex anatomy uh, group patients, a group of patients, and clearly this has been uh, done and it's feasible with uh, very uh, excellent results. And so in terms of final uh, regurgitation, so as usual, no regurgitation, and in terms of uh, final gradient, minimal gradient, even in MAC uh, configuration. So uh, this is really promising for, for the future, and I'm personally really looking forward to uh, using this device in a more regular uh, uh, configuration for my patients who deserve uh, a treatment with this type of complex uh, anatomy. And, but for the time being, uh, we have to acknowledge that this transapical access uh, remains a kind of issue, and that moving to a transfemoral, a full transfemoral procedure makes sense, and that I have the, the feeling that it is what we all expect uh, from uh, a Medtronic and also other companies to come up with a, a well-designed transfemoral system to treat uh, with a replacement mitral regurgitation or even mitral stenosis patients. So I think we should move forward with the lecture from uh, uh, Firas. Yes who is going to drive us uh, through the intrepid uh, mitral 30-day early feasibility study data, including the transfemoral, uh, uh, the transfemoral device. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure and honor to stand before you today to present the 30-day outcomes following transfemoral, transseptal, transcaptor mitral valve replacement, the intrepid TMVR early feasibility study results. I'm Faraz Zahr an uh, interventional cardiologist in Oregon Health and Science University, and I'm honored to present in London Val. This is my disclosure slide. Transcatheter mitral valve replacement holds a lot of promise as a new approach for treating mitral valve disease. However, to date, the transapical devices has the largest reported experience. And although the reduction in mitral regurgitation has been excellent with those devices, there's still some safety concern, especially with the transapical access. Transfemoral TMVR devices are under development and they may improve the procedural safety by femoral access, transeptal access, as opposed to direct transapical access. The objectives of my presentation today is to report the 30-day outcomes of the first 15 patients that were treated with the intrepid transfemoral TMVR early feasibility study, and then we will move on to discuss a, an intrepid transfemoral case procedure. Just a quick reminder, the Intrepid Delivery System is a transfemoral access device with a dilator and a 35 French sheath. It has a cradle and a delivery catheter that consists of an inner catheter and a guide that is designed to deliver the valve to the mitral analyst using very familiar transeptal and left atrial maneuvers. The valve itself is identical to uh, the transapical valve and it's a conformable, conformable outer stent anchors that does not rely on leaflet capture. It's a symmetrical design that eliminates the need for a rotational alignment and inside the outer frame, there is a circular inner stent with a, 20, a 27 millimeter tri-leaflet bovine pericardial valve. The valve is currently available in two sizes, 42 and 48 millimeter. However, the 54 millimeter valve is in development. There are 11 sites across the United States that participated uh, in the early feasibility study. And of these uh, six sites contributed patients to the 15 patients that are presented in this cohort today. The study is a prospective multi-center non-randomized early feasibility study. It collects clinical and echocardiographic outcome according to the standard MVARC definition. There is an external physician screening committee that reviews all the cases and the protocol specified echo acquisition that is reviewed by the echo core lab that is housed in Mayo Clinic. There's also an independent adjudication committee for safety events. The key inclusion criteria for this study is that patients need to have at least moderate to severe symptomatic uh, mitral regurgitation. They have to be high or extreme risk for mitral valve surgery as deemed by the local heart team that include uh, the SDS uh, prom. However, it is a heart team decision. Uh, anatomy has to be suitable for the intrepid 
uh, transfemoral transeptal delivery. The, exclu the main exclusion criteria for this trial was life expectancy less than 12 months. If there was any anatomical consideration and contraindication for the intrepid TMVR system that include uh, annular size, a small new LVOT or severe LV dysfunction, severe and prohibitive mitral annular calcification was an exclusion criteria. So was severe tricuspid regurgitation and or RV dysfunction. 26 patients presented to the screening committee and were reviewed. Uh, uh, of those patients, uh, four patients were declined due to anatomical reasons and two patients withdrew consent. Therefore, 20 patients were approved to being treated and, and the data log was done after the first 15 patients were treated. And of those 15 patients, uh, all of them underwent the procedure. One patient had a conversion to sternotomy after delivering the intrepid valve. There was a lot of thickening uh, of the uh, mitral leaflet as deemed after uh, sternotomy. And uh, the subvalvular apparatus was thick and that was result resulting to ejecting the valve over about half an hour after the, uh, the implant. And then eventually the valve was removed and the patient had a, a surgical MVR. This patient uh, was followed up to up to 30 day and then exited the study per the protocol. The baseline characteristics for, for those patients are as expected, they're elderly. Uh, the mean age was uh, 80 years old. The majority of them uh, were male uh, uh, and they're two thirds of them uh, were symptomatic with a class three, a class four heart failure. They have comorbid conditions, including diabetes, hypertension, uh, atrial fibrillation, prior cardiac surgery, and uh, uh, almost half of them have prior hospitalization for heart failure. The etiology for their mitral regurgitation is, is, is primary, degenerative mitral regurgitation, with almost a third of them has secondary mitral regurgitation. The mean ejection fraction was 48% for this cohort. And switch gear to focus on the procedural uh, aspect uh, uh, of the implant procedures. The time from the delivery catheter insertion to removal uh, was 46 minutes. Uh, as expected, the largest valve is the one that was, the 48 millimeter valve is the one that was used uh, most frequently. And the ASD for the transeptal was handled by ballooning the transeptal axis in majority of the patients, and the majority of them had their SD closed at the end, end of the procedure at the same time as the index procedure. Most patients stays in the hospital for about five days, and they were, the majority of them were discharged home. Of those 15 patients, 14 had successful implant. As we discussed, there was one patient who was converted to sternotomy due, due to uh, vibe migration, and one patient had myocardial infarction due to air embolus. And that patient came back at a later date and got their uh, intrepid valve implanted and is counted in this cohort. The 30 day outcome of those 15 patients demonstrated zero mortality at 30 days, no stroke or TIA, as no patient underwent any reintervention for their mitral valve, and no new pacemaker implantations. There was seven embark defined as major bleeding events. That, and six of them were related to major vascular complications. There was one patient who was rehospitalized two weeks after the implant with a GI bleed. And there was another patient who was hospitalized due to a minor vascular complication related to a pseudoaneurysm on the contralateral side. The 30-day echocardiographic outcome demonstrated almost complete elimination of mitral regurgitation with all the patients has none or trace mitral regurgitation. The same hold true for any perivabular leak. All patients has none or trace perivabular leak at 30 days echo follow-up. LVOT obstruction is, is, a, is a main concern for transcatheter mitral valve replacement. And in this cohort, there was no, uh, all patients has none or mild LVOT obstruction at 30 days as defined by a peak velocity less than three meter per second. Where the majority of the patients when they enter the study has a New York heart class three and four at 30 days, the majority of them 
where class one and two heart failure was demonstrate clinically significant and statistically significant improvement in their New York heart class classification. So in conclusion, despite the fact that this is an early feasibility study, we had very favorable procedural characteristics with familiar mitral valve positioning maneuver, simplified positioning, anchoring and deployment of the valves and short and acceptable procedural times. It was improved 30 day major clinical outcome compared to the transapical experience with no death, stroke, or reinterventions at 30 days. Obviously, the limitation of the study that the vascular complications were, uh, were relatively high, and there was frequent major bleeding events, likely driven by the large bore sheath. And we are hoping that the new and under development 29 French uh, delivery system will improve those outcomes, as well as we have frequent major bleeding that require standardization of vascular access and closure, as well as post-op anticoagulation regimen. Obviously, we need that we had a frequent ASD closure, and we need to discuss what to do with those ASDs, and especially as, as the delivery system uh, gets smaller. Next, we'll move on for uh, to discuss the case study. This is an 80 year old uh, gentleman uh, who was symptomatic with class two heart failure, uh, who was evaluated by the valve clinic uh, for severe symptomatic mitral regurgitation. The patient deemed to be a high surgical risk based on his STS score, frailty, and uh, his age. And uh, he, was, uh, he was presented for a 48 millimeter intrepid device. As you can see, he had mild MAC on his CT as well as his ejection fraction with 46%. This is his pre-procedural uh, CT that shows a perimeter of 127 millimeter, and that was consistent with a 16% oversizing with a 48 millimeter intrepid valve. On the procedural day, transeptal was performed four centimeter above the mitral plane. That usually allow us to have enough room above the valve above the mitral valve to position or, and orient our intrepid valve. The transeptal was dilated with a 14 millimeter balloon. And then the 37 French pre-curved delivery sheath was advanced into the left atrium. And after the sheath was de-aired, the delivery system was, was, uh, was advanced. Then the capsule was advanced into the left atrium. The sheath was retracted to the right atrium. And then the delivery catheter was, uh, was maneuvered. So the capsule of the valve is coaxial to the mitral annulus, as you can see on the uh, MPR uh, TEE images here. We then exposed the brim of the mitral valve and that will give us a very good visualization, both on fluoroscopy as well as on TEE. And we can do any fine tune adjustment that is needed to maintain coaxiality of the intrepid valve on the mitral analyst. After we were happy with the position, uh, we started rapid pacing and the intrepid valve was advanced into position and it was deployed. The patient was hemodynamically stable during that part of the procedure. And as you can see, the intrepid valve was deployed within the first row of the fixation ring. Immediately, the valve was functioning. There was no mitral regurgitation or perivalvular uh, regurgitation. And we had an excellent hemodynamic uh, 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 right after deployment of the valve with the mean gradient of three millimeter mercury across the valve. And the LVOT gradient, as expected by the pre-procedural planning, was very mild with the mean LVOT gradient of two millimeter and a peak gradient of four millimeter mercury, as you can see with the pressure tracing. So in summary, the 30-day data from the intrepid TMVR transfemoral early feasibility study demonstrate no mortality, stroke, reintervention, or new pacemaker implantation at 30 days. Half of the patients has greater than major bleeding event as defined by the MVARC, and it was largely due to access site major vascular complications. There was very favorable hemodynamics with almost complete elimination of mitral regurgitation at 30 days. There was significant improvement in New York Heart Class Association for the patients who were enrolled in this cohort. And finally, the transfemoral procedure with the intrepid device is feasible 
and potentially provide a straightforward approach for elimination of mitral regurgitation. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you, Firas. So we've seen all here a beautiful demonstration of Intrepid latest generation implantation. I mean, Firas is a very skilled interventional cardiologist, but shows you the potential of this device to treat our patients. And uh, we will be helped a lot of the experience with that we have with the transcatheter systems. Uh, most importantly, you see that imaging is going to play a key role and uh, the data will, uh, will be uh, at the level of our expectations. So we're happy with this. Didier, we have a lot of questions from the chat, yeah? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There are uh, many questions coming from the chat, so thank you for, for that. It tells us about the interest of the community towards this type of technology. So uh, the first thing, because we have all submitted patients, many of us have submitted patients to, uh, for inclusion within trials, and the rejection rate is somewhat high. And so, uh, according to uh, your experience, Thomas, uh, a question from Dan, what is the uh, acceptance rate in the Apollo trial, or the screen failure rate, depending on the, the way you want to understand that? Dan is Daniel Blackman. <laughs> we can see him even the, 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 in the dark. Um, so <laughs> this is a good question, Daniel, but the question, the response is not that easy because I think under the number I'm gonna give you back, we, we have three different categories of rejection reasons. So the, the quick answer is um, around 40% of patients that we are screening today are rejected, non-eligible. Three major reasons for that. One of them, the, the first one is how large is the analyst because the patients are referred very lately. And this will be addressed almost in more than 90% of the cases uh, by the new uh, size of the 54. So we will be covering this unmet need for today's indications, I would say. The other reason is the LVOT, risk obstruction. And if you take it isolately, it should turn around 60% so far. But of course, the patients are not only rejected for this reason, there are some other, some other factors. And also, this particular question is we are constant, constantly improving uh, thanks to one of the slides I've shown you is that the calculation of the NEO LVOT, and with Intrepid we can go as, as uh, low as 1.5 uh, centimeter square, square centimeter. So this is a very good improvement, I would say, by uh, improving this understanding on which phase is much more crucial for, for the, the obstruction calculation or estimation. And the third one is the access. Of course, transapical is in elderly patients or also because of the access to, be, to get orthogonal uh, implant in, in the mature annulus. And we think that with the, 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 the transfemoral system that we can discuss also about, the navigability that is offered by this uh, uh, catheter, this uh, access denial will be also addressed. So this is my response. So you have addressed one of the questions from uh, Regina uh, Riberas, who is also with us today, about the uh, cutoff value for the uh, NEO LVOT, and it's 1.5 centimeters square, as you mentioned. And it's not really uh, anymore about um, analyzing the uh, mitral, auric, my, automitral uh, angle. Uh, so there is um, uh, an, a question that, it, that was quite interesting, and I think you are, uh, as a surgeon, Thomas, it would be nice that you uh, address that, it's coming from uh, Omar Shehab, is uh, it's all about the, uh, the impact of TMER uh, devices on the mitral valve apparatus. Uh, what are your uh, perspectives on that, being a surgeon? So this is a big difference uh, of uh, replacing percutaneously and uh, replacing surgically. So for mitral regurgitation, we're not talking about MAC where you have to cut all the, um, the apparatus. For, for with the percutaneous system, regardless of the disease, uh, surgeons usually cut at least half of the mitral valve. Not all of us, but the majority of the publications and the reports after following, following valve replacement has been done by cutting at least the anterior mitral valve leaflet. And you know what you do, when you do this, you lose half of the functionality or, or uh, under-preserve the functionality of the left ventricle. And this is completely preserved with the transcatheter mitral valve replacement or repair, I would say. So you're just putting it in a valve, but you keep the attachment between the annulus and the papillary muscles thanks to the, the, the cords. From physiological point of view, this is a major advantage. 
So thank you for this uh, clear uh, answer. And there is um, there are a couple of questions um, uh, around the um, profile, the type of FM, the type of mitral regurgitation that was uh, treated, included in the Apollo trial. It's true that most of the examples that were presented today are primary uh, mitral regurgitation patients. Uh, so the question is. Uh, were, was a functional mitral regurgitation a contraindication? I would say no. Yeah. So to your opinion, uh, does it have something to do with the apical access, for example, and the relationship with the LV function? Yeah, probably because the functional mitral regurgitation patients have much more dilated ventricles, and, uh, and they are, many of these patients were elderly, as we have seen it. So uh, there, I think also based on the very uh, few surgical reports, and there's only two in the literature which has been published uh, in New England Journal of Medicine, it shows clearly that replacement eliminate mitral regurgitation and data over time, if, it does, if this, the replacement does not, uh, is not superior to repair in this uh, functional mitral regurgitation patients, it has no recurrence of um, FMR. Uh, of mitral regurgitation. So replacement for functional mitral regurg regurgitation based on surgical literature, eliminate mitral regurg. So there is something that, um, that was asked by uh, Jacqueline uh, da Rocha e Silva. It's about the need for uh, BAV when treated MAC, uh, treating MAC patients with a TM TMVR device. And the overall answer is uh, yes, uh, just to, uh, to make sure that the device is going to expand appropriately. And this, this is probably going to be standard of care in the future. That's already what we do with other devices. And I guess with the Intrepid, it's also really, it will be recommended to pre-dilate uh, before expanding the, the device. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes, Thomas, but there is something that we need to, uh, to address uh, because there are uh, definitely the, the the future is towards the transfemoral access, a full transeptal procedure, but there are inherent challenges. So uh, in terms of first vascular access, because we're gonna go through the femoral vein, for the time being with quite large devices, we've seen that the intrepid is going to come up in a 29 uh, French profile. Uh, what are your uh, concerns about this, uh, the, um, this transfemoral access? Do you think that it's going to be suitable for every single patient, or is it going to be a limitation for some patients? Uh, I mean, the, the, the venous access with the 29 French uh, generation will be wider applicable for, for our patients. However, we will have also to look at the venous trajectory as we do it for the artery for TAVI, for example. We are not used to do it, but we know that we can face some problems. I mean, some of the surgeons in the room do minimally invasive surgery and peripheral cannulation, and we know that we can have big troubles even with the smaller catheters and cannulas, uh, much more from the vein, venous side than from the arterial side. So we have also to learn as implanters for t of tomorrow how to evaluate uh, the, the access and the safety of access with this bigger device, I would say, because even if the cutter is 29 French, we still need a sheath which make it a bit bigger. So we have to secure it. But it can be done percutaneously indeed. Excellent. Uh, so I, I guess it's the end of the session. So you're going to wrap up the session, uh, Thomas. But I would say that for, uh, from my side, uh, what I learned today is that with the um, we will have the ability in the near future to uh, treat our patients, um, a wider range of mitral regurgitation patients, with a single device, a kind of one device fits all type of anatomies, and this is really encouraging uh, for the future because there is an unmet need and there is a need for that. And I was uh, really pleased to see the clinical results and then the, the procedural uh, examples of patients that were treated with very complex anatomies and at last the transfemoral system which is what we are expecting, so it's really encouraging. So uh, the, floor, the floor is yours for your final uh, take-home messages. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Medtronic uh, for giving us the opportunity, DJ and myself, to co-animate uh, this session together with you uh, and to offer this uh, therapy, uh, invest in this therapy for our patients uh, all over the world, and especially in Europe. We are very thankful for this. Uh, my main take home messages is that we have to keep in mind that there are clinical and anatomical variabilities for mitral regurgitation or mitral disease in general and I think 
as usual now, we have to put the patient in the middle of everything and tailor the therapy for him and not make the therapy, uh, to, I mean, not make the patient adapt to the therapy. This is a very important thing and a good understanding for better selection is really key. We didn't talk much about imaging, but imaging is going to be the major player in this uh, setting to increase the awareness and uh, the, the referrals. Invasivity of the therapy itself is evolving also. We are moving from transapical to transfemoral, and this is, uh, became a reality, and some other uh, uh, devices will come also and are going in this direction. And this is a, why also the community is interested much more than ever in the transcatheter mitral valve replacement based on the unmet needs that we have in our daily practice with repairs. Oral anticoagulants, in my point of view, is going to be a big problem, but we have to understand a bit more what are the needs in terms of uh, anticoagulation. We don't really know yet. We don't have enough follow-up or experience, and many of the patients have already AF, but we, this has to be addressed. Uh, positive point, we know that uh, I would say we are, the indications are in constant enlargements. And the limitations of today will not be there anymore. I mean, many of us had the chance to start the TAVI 20 years ago now. And we are, some questions are exactly the same that the one we have been asking ourselves 20 years ago. So let's look to the future and uh, we will meet again to talk about this and some other questions. Thank you very much. So thank you. <laughs>